Hello guys, welcome to another video. In the previous episodes, we've spoken about how psychology can affect UX and UX decisions, UX design decisions, as well as how you could uh, target specific elements within your design to your users online. Here at Relab, we work on a lot of e-commerce and transactional products. So oftentimes we're hired to help our clients convert more, whether it's add to cart rates or whether it's conversion rates or sign up rates. So there are things that I find over the years that is a little bit of a pattern that's always very, very useful uh, to keep in the back of our minds when we're designing for conversion. So here are the 11 tips that I wanted to share with you and hopefully you find it useful. Number one is to amp the visual cues on your calls to actions. We've discussed this in the previous video as well when we spoke about the seven psychology rules, but you know, it sounds like a no brainer, but you want to draw attention to your most important call to action or CTAs. The more clicks that you get out of it, the chances or for conversion is better. Obviously you want to make sure that you deliver what is expected by the user upon them clicking that call to action. So whether it's another page or whether it's a form or whether it's a downloadable PDF or whatever it may be, you just wanted to make sure that it delivers their expectation. Where it falls off usually is what is when you create an expectation with a strong CTA or call to action, but you don't actually deliver or follow through with the experience. So you just want to keep that in mind. It needs to be, you know, prominent visual visually appealing with good level of contrast, but it also needs to deliver the expectation. Number two is to simplify forms or input fields. So there's a lot of this sort of uh, component, if you may call that an online you know, environment, whether it's an e-commerce store, a website or whatnot, but there's an expectation for users to sign up to something or fill up a form. Even when they're buying something, of course, they'll need to go through a checkout form. But the more users have to type or fill in something, the less likely that they're going to convert. Of course, you're watching this and then you go, oh, yep, yep, yep. But then how do you do that is probably the challenge. But then if you work with you know, modern technologies, if you're working with really good engineering team, there are always new things that can be done and they can provide you with that insight in terms of you know, autofill or any type of automation that could happen. Um, the other thing is when you have your user sign up to your website or whatever it may be and then you use that in a more meaningful way, then obviously you can help them as well to go through the process of filling up forms where they don't need to put as much effort to fill that anymore in the future. Uh, but do that with a good intent rather than more of a commercial one. Always think about the users and then the commercial value will come uh, automatically after that. Number three is to leverage visuals. You want to give your users the clearest and most detailed visual cue that can help them understand your product or service. Uh, this helps them when they're comparing certain products or different product categories, or even comparing your website to a competitor's website. So that's a huge point of differentiation for some brands. You'll find brands like, as an example, the one that I can think of is Airbnb, where they would invest a lot of time, effort to produce really high quality visuals for their products, which are the accommodations as opposed to some other websites or their competitors, particularly in the past when they were just you know, starting. Uh, that was one of their biggest uh, differentiator. So don't undermine the, the power of uh, strong visuals. And by, when I say visuals, you can also think about videos. So um, there's a research by HubSpot that showed that embedding videos in a landing page can boost conversion by 80%. And 90% of customers say that products with videos actually help them make buying decisions. So if you think about that and you use that with intent, it's being placed correctly at the right spot in the right layout, uh, it will generate higher engagement and conversion rates for your website. Number four is to highlight user interviews. Now, he, as humans, we're social creatures. We look at what others say. Uh, we really believe in our peers and their point of views. Uh, social proof is a huge thing for us. So when you're buying something online, I mean, I do this. Uh, I go and search for reviews of a product. Specifically, if it's something that I have never worn before, I've never purchased before, I want to go and see what others say about it. Same goes with service. Or if I go to a restaurant, I want to go and check out the Google reviews and see what the people say. You're trying to find patterns and you're trying to, to find social proofs. Therefore, 
What you want to do from a UX point of view is to highlight user reviews if you can leverage that. If you have that data, you have that functionality, as long as it's real, genuine reviews, not something that you've made up, then it's of course will be very, very helpful to others that are trying to find out more about the product or the service. One thing that I want to say about reviews though is you have to think about the micro user experience when people are reading reviews as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the more is better, but the more genuine, the more insightful it is, the better. So even if you have, say, five insightful reviews that are not consistently the same, they are quite unique with different perspectives, they are genuine, that could bring a lot more value than, say, 100 reviews that says perfect all the time. So just think about things like that and how that could help the readers as opposed to helping the brand only look good. Before I continue with point number five, I just wanted to say thank you for watching guys and um, thank you for all of the comments that you've given. If you enjoy the content that we're making, if you enjoy all of these videos and you find it insightful, please subscribe or share it with your other friends who's not subscribed yet. Check the data. Um, there's actually a lot of you that keeps on coming back and watching our videos, but you're not subscribed. So please do that if you really enjoy it. I'd really appreciate it. Number five is don't put a wall for the checkout process. What that means is really you just want to make the whole process as easy as possible. Although sometimes you need to compromise certain things, then put that into consideration. Think about the benefits of reducing um, you know, certain elements in it. Uh, as an example, there's a debate between guest checkout or an account signed in checkout. That's oftentimes a business decision and a, the strategy behind all of that. But for a lot of brands, sometimes they're going down the path of, yes, allowing for an easy guest checkout and then talk about signing up in the, at the end of it. So that's something that you just want to consider at the beginning, make sure that everyone's aligned with it and it goes well with the business strategy. For some other brands, like a Tesla, for example, they would have you sign and not sign up, but at least give some information before they have you go through the a further checkout process. I'm sure there are thoughts around all of that. The point is to make it really easy and seamless, leverage existing technologies that are available. If we're talking about a simple, small business website here, have a look at how Shopify does their checkout, which is always consistent and it's almost a must to go through that sort of experience because it's a Shopify process, uh, but it's one of the most highest converting checkout. And so look at things like that and see what you can find and see what you can learn from uh, those sort of products. Number six is just to continue on the theme of checkout. Let's make it really, really smooth. So um, what you want to do is make sure that the process of checking out, whether it's filling up your shipping details, your personal details, your credit card details, making it really smooth and as seamless as possible is the best way to do it. The thing is with the online world, there's so many distractions and, and by distractions, I mean, you know, where uh, websites tend to put buttons everywhere and navigation points everywhere. You'll find some of the best converting checkout pages are really simple. They've stripped down a lot of things. They've changed the header, they've changed the menu, they've changed the footer and having the users really focus focus on what they're doing at that moment, and that is a checkout process. That's like you at a counter in a retail shop or a traditional retail shop trying to purchase an item just to make that one-way connection or one-way flow of you buying the product and paying for it and getting out from the store uh, with a delightful experience. So think about that uh, when you're thinking about checkout. And number seven is apply discount codes easily or allow users to apply discount codes easily. Now I know this might be controversial for retailers and some of the businesses out there, but I guess you want to think about it with uh, what the strategy is behind that marketing piece. So if it was a campaign, you're actually, you know, having people uh, or promoting your code and you want people to buy more because of a certain event, whether it's Black Friday or Father's Day or whatever it may be, then you wanted to make sure that the checkout would accommodate that because you're already setting that expectation up front through your, you know, your email newsletters or the homepage banner that has that big discount code or your Instagram posts and things like that. And so don't make it hard for your users to find how to apply the discount codes. Make it as automatically implemented as, as, as much as you can without them having to put too much effort in terms of trying to 
get their discount codes um, applied to their cart. So think about that process, think about the intent of why you created a discount code at the beginning. Don't make it hard for the users when you've set expectations. Number eight is when you sell a product or service, make your pricing crystal clear and the benefits or as well as the uh, whatever they get out of that price. So again, if we just talk about a simple product being sold online in an e-commerce store, then you want to talk about the benefits of that product clearly, what are the, um, the highlights of that particular product, the feature. Well, you want to make it quite easy for them to be able to compare multiple products at once. One of the top reasons why people abandon their cart is because of pricing. It might be that it's not clear or they can't tell the, what the value is in buying that product or it's not clear enough, therefore they can't make a purchasing decision or they'll drop off because they wanted to compare something else or do more research or get more insights before they go and buy your product. So highlight the value of what they're getting when they're about to pay. So for example, if people want to know the return policy, the shopping costs, the service charges and all of that, and make that very clear along with your products. And that's included within say like the cart or the price that they're paying. So the more clear it is, the more likely that your users are, are going to see the clear benefits and the value of the products that they're going to buy and the higher chances for them to convert as well. Number nine is to somehow build a favorite, a wish list, a shopping list type of feature. Oftentimes we don't make decisions at the get-go when we're first researching or trying to buy a product. We may come back to it the second, the third, the fifth, or maybe the tenth time before buying the product or making that decision. So what we want to do as an online store oftentimes is to allow the website to remember what you've added to cart or what you've added into the wish list. There are, of course, so many different ways technically in terms of how to do that, and I'm not the expert in it, but if you talk to your web developers, your engineers, there are ways, there are so many different ways out there and applications that can do that quite effectively for you. And what you could do as well is that could be integrated with the CRM system or email systems that you use that you are able to send things like, you know, abandoned cart emails or just a subtle reminder that you've left this a week ago. Maybe that's way too long, maybe a couple of days ago, whether you're still interested in it or not. But that sort of feature oftentimes helps and it's actually one of the biggest converting uh, features in an e-commerce website, abandoned cart. So have a look at that and consider that in your next project. Number 10 is to make it personal. You've probably heard of personalization before or the concept of personalization. It is not easy to achieve that online, but we're definitely much better today as opposed to five to six or eight years ago. There are definitely technologies that are really advanced to be able to support you to do that sort of thing. One research from McKinsey says that majority of consumers polled personalization as part of the online shopping experience. It's quite high and 76% are more likely to purchase because of personalization features. There's more attachment to their experience and it actually benefits them, benefits the brand and loyalty as well that comes with that whole feature. So when you're designing for account members or registered users or your VIPs, make sure that they get that sort of value or benefits because they've obviously given their details, they've signed up to your program or whatever it may be. But the more it feels personalized, the more that they feel that they are special, there's a high likely conversion point that could be leveraged out of that whenever you run campaigns, events or whatever it may be. So hopefully you can think about that as well in your next process. Uh, when trying to improve conversion rates. Number 11, which is the last one in this case, is that users prefer to chat to someone. So chatting to someone and chatting to someone quickly and someone real as well, I might add to that, is actually very important for most users, depending on what products are we talking about here. But I guess if we're talking about live chat, there's a lot of negative connotation around it just because it's being handled by a bot and doesn't feel genuine or it doesn't feel real. So if that's the case, then you might want to strip that feature out. But then studies actually show that customers, if they have the choice, they prefer to chat to someone and chatting is still the highest 
preference as opposed to email or telephone. So it's just more convenient, faster, less intrusive for a lot of people, but it needs to deliver, which means you want to allocate a certain process or system, whether you know you have a customer service team member that does that, but you, they want to chat and they want to chat to someone real. And if you can do that, also it also lifts up conversion points because they get the answers that they want. Uh, they suddenly know which product or which size is suited for them. And they just get that instant support from a real person, just like being in the shop. So that's one of the things that uh, you could do as well to increase conversion rates in an e-commerce store. So there you have it, guys. I hope that's been helpful. Those 11 points um, in your next you know, e-commerce project, your transactional product project, whether it's B2B, B2C, it actually applies to everything. As long as we're still dealing with humans, then these principles will work. Um, like I said, uh, if you find this helpful, please share it with your friends or your colleagues. Uh, who knows that will benefit them as well in their next project. Um, for the meantime, I hope you have a good day. See ya.